Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Lydia Mashburn, Chairman Ron Paul's Policy Director for his Subcommittee on Domestic Monetary Policy. <coughs> on behalf of Congressman Ron Paul and his office, I welcome you to the first in our three-part afternoon tea lecture series on the basic principles of money. Thank you for coming. Um, today's question, what is money, is a simple one, but a rarely asked question, and as such, not properly understood. Um, understanding money as a market phenomenon versus understanding it as a government phenomenon is crucial to understanding our economy in general and understanding the recent crises that we have faced in the past few years. Um, to help us answer this question of what is money, we have joining us today Dr. Joseph Salerno, who is a professor of economics at Pace University. He is also the academic vice president for the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. Um, and he is the author of the book, Money, Sound, and Unsound. Uh, he will speak for about 35 or 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A. Um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Salerno. Thank you, Lydia. And thanks for all being here. I mean, it's a great turnout. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, but as Lydia pointed out, what I want to do is to address a deceptively simple question, the question of what is money? Uh, we all use it every day. So, you know, it's part of our daily lives. Um, but if you, if you examine it a little bit more closely, if you think about why you would accept for uh, maybe a house that you're selling or um, your very valuable labor time, pieces of paper with green ink on them that the materials in which cost about four cents. Um, that might puzzle you. Why would, because you have no intention to, to use the, these, uh, these notes or, or paper tickets directly, right? You can't eat them. I mean, you can't, you can't uh, use them for wallpaper, though this could, could use them maybe. Um, and I mean, maybe a miser like, you know, would want to you know, lie in his bed at night and fondle them or something. But normal people have no direct use for these pieces of paper. Okay. So there's a lot of uh, other questions that come up when you're talking about money. Um, uh, for example, you know, why are 80% of the $100 bills that have been printed in the U.S. outside the country being used to finance drug trade uh, and, or being used as a hedge against inflation by citizens of other countries with um, irresponsible monetary systems? Uh, things like that, which I won't address. But, but, but the basic question of why would we accept paper tickets worth very little in exchange for very valuable goods deserves an answer. So what I want to do is to give you that answer, but that answer has to be given historically. Okay, so we want to start from the beginning, um, and that is uh, what, what occurred before there was money? I mean, if you go back to primitive times, um, you'll, you'll find that there were instances of barter. You won't find many of them. Okay. Even the ancient Babylonians had records, the first you know, records of history to talk about money. But there was a time before there was money. Um, and that a state of affairs is called barter, where people would, would exchange things that they intended to use directly to satisfy their wants for other things that they uh, valued less. So I, I put up a little um, model up there. Uh, and what I want to point out is that there is an almost an insurmountable problem with barter, or uh, a problem that makes it very, very um, uh, costly in terms of time and resources to use barter to satisfy your wants. And that is what we call double coincidence of wants. Um, that term, which seems forbidding at first, uh, really just refers to the fact that, look, I may want what you have, okay? I may want that pastry that you have, okay? But you may not want my watch. Okay, you may have enough watches. Okay, so in this case, let's say that um, A is desperately need, uh, in need of a pair of shoes and has eggs. Um, so he wants what B has, but B's allergic to eggs, breaks out in hives and so on, and doesn't want, doesn't want to hear about eggs. Even a thought of, of them make, makes him nauseous. Okay, now that would be the end of it. He would then have to begin to search, and especially in an area that's not densely populated, for someone else that was capable of, of producing shoes. But if he was ingenious and persistent, he would hit upon a solution that at first seems more complicated and less likely to achieve his ends, 
but in fact is much more efficient. And that is indirect exchange. A may know that everyone in that society uses salt. Okay, this is before refrigeration. Um, so people use it to season their foods, but also to preserve their, their, their perishable meats and so on and so forth. And so he knows that there's a wide demand among people who make many different goods for salt. So what he would do then would be to take his eggs to some person C, okay, and there's a lot of C's out there, a lot of people who have salt, and find the person who would want the eggs in exchange for salt. Then he would per, uh, exchange for the salt. But he, he himself doesn't want the salt, okay? At that moment in time, you have the emergence of indirect exchange, the first step towards money. We don't know when it happened. We don't know what individual discovered it, that way of, of solving the, the problem of barter, the double coincidence of wants. But what we do know is then A would turn around with that salt and use it a, a, in order to exchange for the um, shoes that he initially wanted. Others will see that A solved his problem that way, and then will begin to emulate him. Okay? But the more people that use salt, the more widely, for medium of exchange, the more widely acceptable it is, and therefore the better a medium of exchange it is. So as, as time goes on, salt becomes, in that society, a medium of exchange. Okay? It's, yes, it's still used directly to satisfy certain human wants, but its main use becomes the facilitation of, uh, of further exchanges. So um, as we'll see, then everyone is, is permitted to specialize because they, they're confident that no matter what they produce, they can always sell it for salt and then use the salt to buy all the other things they need. Another problem with barter very quickly is if someone has an indivisible good, a good like a, a dairy cow, um, and that person wants clothes, whiskey, um, shoes, and other things, well, if he cuts the cow up, the dairy cow, it loses its, its value. So how does he buy these different things from different people without dividing up that cow? Well, very simply, he takes a cow and he sells it for salt. Sells it for you know, 15 barrels of salt and then divides the salt up among the other specialists we wants to buy from. So these problems are then solved in that way. Um, let me just give you, and, and we know in history that many different um, items, useful items, were used as media of exchange, okay, which is the plural of medium of exchange, which means simply the intermediary good that people buy, not because they want it, but because they want to give it away again in the future for something more valuable, which is why we hold the dollars. Okay? And we'll come back to that. Um, cattle were used in ancient Greece, leather in, in Rome, maize or corn uh, in Mexico, uh, wampum, the, the, the strings of beads uh, were used um, in, uh, by the American Indians. And you've heard the story, I don't know if, whether it's apocryphal or not, that um, the Dutch purchased Manhattan Island from the Indians for $26 worth of wampum. Um, dried fish in the Canadian maritime colonies. Salt was used, and so was iron implements, farming implements in, in parts of Africa. Um, wives were used, wives were used in, in ancient Egypt. Before the advent of capitalism, women were a little more than chattel property, okay? So if, if you weren't able to watch it, uh, if, if they were bothering you while you were watching a, uh, a football game, you could say, well, you know, you're going to be someone else's wife tomorrow. Um, but, and finally, there were actually dried tobacco was used uh, in, 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 in the colonies of Virginia. All right, so all of these things were used. But a few goods came to be used throughout the world over time, okay, because of the qualities that they embodied as media of exchange. Um, but before I get to, 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 to those goods, let me just mention that there are some modern examples, interesting modern examples of, of money arising in emergency situations. And uh, some of you have had economics, you must have heard the story of the POW camps, the German POW camps. Uh, American prisoners um, received rations from, from the, their German captors, as well as care packages from the Red Cross during World War II. Uh, an, an economist happened, uh, an American economist happened to be a captive in a POW camp, prisoner of war, and um, recorded all of this. And what he found was when people got their care packages and their rations you know, every week or month, um, there were many things in, in those packages. It was chocolate, razor blades, socks, underwear, cigarettes, and so on. But if you've, you've seen old World War II movies, what does everybody do? They all smoke. 
Okay. Um, and so what occurred, and that, 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 you know, it's representative of what actually happened. Since everyone used cigarettes, eventually people who had too much chocolate and wanted razor blades but couldn't find someone with razor blades who also wanted his chocolate would begin to exchange for cigarettes. So eventually, on each barracks, there were, or each, uh, each you know, pr pr uh, prison building, uh, there was posted cigarette prices of the various goods and services. So money emerged. Okay? And there was inflation and deflation. As the month wore on, people smoked the cigarettes, so that prices went down because there were fewer in the camp. And then when the new packages came in, they went up again. But I found another interesting example in, in uh, Iraq. Um, there was an article by um, a former Marine who um, did a seven-month stint in Iraq. Um, and he was posted in a number of different farming villages. And um, a lot of, of wealth had been destroyed, real wealth, uh, houses, cars, trucks, so on. Um, fishing boats, and um, the, go the, the people of the villages, rightly so, didn't put much trust in the money that was being issued, paper money that was being issued by Baghdad. And so what they did was, um, they all owned sheep, whether you were affluent, you, 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 if you were affluent, you would have a, a huge um, herd of sheep, but even the poorer families had some sheep. And so what began to happen was, people began to exchange sheep for other goods and services and write their contracts in sheep and repay debts in sheep. But sheep are big and very valuable in that sort of, of an economy. So a second good began to emerge alongside the sheep. And th these villages were located near the Euphrates uh, uh, River. The Euphrates River, the water in the Euphrates River, was suitable for watering their crops and, and, um, and, and, and for the sheep, but not for human consumption. So water from the cities was generally purchased and came in in, in in big trucks. People began to, for smaller purchases, use water because everyone drank water, especially in the summer. Okay, and then finally, cigarettes. We usually smoked at night with uh, chai tea um, by the villagers, and so cigarettes were in circulation. So we had three parallel monies, okay? and and the paper money wasn't used at all. Okay, and this was in 2007 that this occurred. Okay, so those are some examples. All right, so as trade with different regions and, and, and countries began to develop, as small groups began to trade with other small groups, and we began to get a network of interregional and even international trade during the Middle Ages, um, a few goods emerged as the general media of exchange. We talk about the general medium of exchange, we mean that good which is universally and routinely accepted by everyone without giving it a second thought. And right now, the, the Federal Reserve note is such a, a good. We don't think twice about accepting uh, Federal Reserve notes or claims on Federal Reserve notes, which is bank deposits, um, in exchange for all the goods we sell and for the labor that we sell to our employers. Okay? So it's a medium of exchange in that sense, when people do not even think twice about it, but simply accept it and pass it on. Um, and you, you, the question I asked in the beginning can be answered by pointing out that the reason why you accept these pieces of paper is because they have a pre-existing purchasing power. You know that people are willing to accept them at certain prices for different things, so that you accept them and then you pass them on. That happened with gold and silver. Okay? So over centuries, an evolutionary process took place in which gold and silver, and to some extent copper, outcompeted all of the other media, uh, local media of exchange, so that they became the world money. Now, let me just very quickly uh, talk about the uh, qualities of a good medium of exchange. First of all, as you saw in the Iraq example, they have to be generally acceptable. They have to be widely used in that society. That's the first quality. It's extremely important. Gold and silver were used in almost all societies and cultures as religious rituals, for ornamentation, as jewelry, uh, to embroider um, uh, the, the, the dresses and, 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 and suits of, of, of the nobility. So everyone accepted them. Um, but second, they were also highly durable. Okay, remember, when you accept a medium of exchange, you don't want it to deteriorate overnight. That's why cigarettes, for example, aren't a good medium of exchange, because they're used up in, in their natural function. Uh, because you want to hold them until you find um, attractive opportunities on which you want to spend, spend those, the, the, the gold coins or the silver coins. So just keep in mind that almost all the gold that was mined when, let's say, Jesus of Nazareth 
walk the earth still in existence today. Even, six, even, even if you go back to the beginning of recorded history, almost all the gold and silver ever mined are in existence today, except that which has been lost by fire. Gold can be melted and, and can be lost in a fire or sunk in, in, in ships. Right. So gold is extremely durable. Well, but if that's so, why isn't iron a good medium of exchange? Iron did serve as a medium of exchange for a while, but was outcompeted. It's, it's enormously um, uh, durable, very highly durable. Well, there's a third characteristic that's very important, and that is that it must be portable, easy to carry. Um, now, you would say, well, a ton of iron is just as easy to or an ounce of iron is just as easy to carry as an ounce of gold. But the key is the good must have a high value to weight ratio. Okay? So if you wanted to buy uh, a lawnmower at Sears or at Walmart or something that cost $300, had a price of $300, um, you would have to bring you know, just a very small amount of gold, okay, uh, let's see, so at uh, 60, uh, maybe a fifth of an ounce of gold, but you'd have to bring in a ton of iron. Okay? So iron wasn't very portable because it had a very low value to weight ratio, so it was outcompeted. Um, also must be highly divisible, that is you can divide up pieces of gold into very small pieces without them losing any of their value. You cannot do that, for example, with precious gems, which were used as a media, medium of exchange. Okay, if you if if you break up a uh, a diamond, it loses its value, okay, into small pieces. So that's why precious gems were were outcompeted. Um, and then, um, every everything everyone must be homo every unit must be the same as every other unit, identical to the to the other unit. So every ounce of gold ever mined is exactly the same in all its physical properties as every other ounce of gold, which we call homogeneous. That's not true of diamonds. In fact. Diamonds are precisely desired, especially for engagements and so on, because no diamond is like any other diamond. Just as no snowflake, no two snowflakes are exactly the same. Okay, so when something is exactly the same, then it's easy to to um, to recognize the value of it. Whereas since each diamond is different, the value would have to be appraised at each purchase, and it would be um, highly expensive. Um, and finally, it has to be easily recognizable in those old cowboy movies, and I'm not talking about cowboys and aliens, but the, the, the older westerns. Um, you saw, when, when a gold coin was passed uh, in the old west, you would see a, a cowboy biting down onto it. Well, the gold leaves teeth marks because it's, it's, um, it's malleable, it's easy to work with. Whereas fool's gold, which looks very much like gold, I don't know what chemical element it is, but it looks very much like gold, is very hard. So there, was e there were easy tests or some chemical tests that um, allowed you to quickly and inexpensively find out um, if, if you were dealing with the counterfeit or not. Okay. Um, so the bottom line in all this um, is that money was not invented. It was not invented. It wasn't created by the state. It wasn't some wise old benevolent king that said, my people are suffering from, from a lack of coincidence of wants, and therefore I must get all my wise men together and solve this problem. And then they would get together and say, yes, we have to use salt or something like that. That's nonsense. That's not the way it happened. <coughs> Nor was there a big town meeting in which, uh, which um, like, let's say, all the, the Virginia colonists got together in a town meeting and made a contract that we'll all accept tobacco leaves, dried tobacco leaves as money. It's not the way it happened either. Okay? It, it, it happened as a result of a market process which was uh, embodied the actions of millions of people over time, um, all seeking their own benefit, all seeking to solve the problems of indivisibility and, and, and um, coincidence of wants. And in doing so, motivating others to follow their example, so that over time, money arose from, on the market. Government had nothing to do with it. Okay? It stepped in much later and actually distorted uh, the monetary system later on. Uh, let me mention one other thing here, and that is, um, could money come into existence as a paper fiat currency? Fiat meaning issued by the state. Fiat's the Latin word for this must be, or, or this is my will, okay, you will use this paper. Um, no, it, it couldn't. And the reason why it couldn't is because if you, you issued a piece of paper, let, let's say you trusted me completely, okay? Uh, you knew me, you trusted me. 
despite the fact that I'm from New Jersey and my name ends in a vowel. You still thought I was very trustworthy. Okay. Um, so I came to you and I said, look, here's 10 Salernos. Um, can I have your pen or can I have your watch? Uh, well, even if you trust me, you wouldn't accept it because what the hell is it worth? There's no past history, okay? But with gold, silver, salt, iron, there's a past history. There's barter. They were exchanging for other things under barter. So you had an idea of what they were worth. And that's what, why money must come into existence as a useful market commodity and cannot be imposed from without by the, by the state. Okay. Now, let me just uh, mention some of the, um, the benefits of money. First of all, and very importantly, it serves as a unit of pricing. Okay. Um, it allows you to, to compare prices uh, against one another um, with, and, and also as a unit of economic calculation. It allows businesses to calculate their revenues, costs, profits, and losses. Um, in a border economy, let's say there were only 1,000 goods. That means there would be 499,500 prices to, to, to keep track of because each good has 999 other prices because each good potentially can be exchanged for any of the other 999 goods. In a money economy, money is always one half of every transaction. So if there are 1,000 goods, there's 1,000 prices. There's not 499,000 prices. Now, that's just 1,000 goods. The average supermarket in the US today has 27,000 items. So there's millions and millions and millions of different order prices for those goods if they were exchanged against one another. There would be no way to have a supermarket okay, under barter. Um, also under barter, there's very little specialization. That is, people specializing in those things in which they are most productive, which is what raises our, our standard of living and, and the productivity of labor so greatly. Um, and the reason is the following. Let's say I'm, I'm an economics professor, and I want, um, a, let's say, uh, a Wall Street Journal. Well, what, what, how do I get it under barter? Okay, I, 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 there is no money, so I can't sell my services for money. I have to go to the guy and give him a 10 minute economics lecture or something like that, which he probably doesn't want to hear, so he wouldn't give me the Wall Street Journal anyway. Okay? Um, or if I want breakfast, some, something similar, I have to stand there and you know, talk, talk to, the, uh, to, to the, 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 uh, the waitress or whatever. Um, so you see the problem. Okay? And there's a third problem. The third problem that money solves is that you can't produce large, durable consumer goods or, or capital goods because how is the entrepreneur, gonna, the employer, going to pay the workers? Let's say you're producing cars. I mean, are you going to pay the workers in cars? Uh, are you going to break up the cars and try to pay them uh, you know, uh, every two weeks or something like that? Th that's impossible. Or if you're producing something that's not even a consumer's good, like oil or steel, are you going to give them you know, 10 pounds of steel or a barrel of oil? They don't want that. So you would have a very primitive economy under border, and uh, m money solves that problem. Okay. Now, now, again, no one set out to solve all of those problems. No one set out to invent money. Okay. It, again, happened as a result of the interaction of hundreds of millions over time of, 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 of individual human minds. So what is the monetary unit? Okay. Well, since money comes into existence as a commodity, as a useful commodity, most commodities circulate by weight or by volume, ounces of gold, okay, pounds of silver, um, barrels of, of salt. Well, money circulates by weight. That is the unit of money, is a unit of weight of a specific commodity. Uh, and even when the gold standard in the 19th century came into existence, and by then we had names for different national currencies, it was still a unit of weight. Let me just, let me just take three different currencies. Um, the French franc, the British pound, and the um, American dollar. They actually were simply names for units of weight. And let me just give you an example of that. Okay, let's just stick with the pound and the dollar. <coughs> For about 100 years, the dollar was legally defined as one tw about 1 20th of an ounce of gold. That's an approximation. Okay. And the British pound was defined from 1821 to 1931 when Britain went off the gold standard. 
as one fourth of an ounce of gold. They weren't different monies. They were the same money. Now, the exchange rate for all the 19th century, now we used to exchange rates, I was in Austria, so I was continuously watching the exchange rates between the euro and the dollar um, last week uh, to, to make the most advantageous exchange of my euros for dollars and back to dollars and so on. Um, and it was, it was changing all the time, every day. But for 100 years, it was stable. The exchange rate between dollars and pounds were, was approximately $4.86 per pound. Some people say that under the gold standard, many economists say that under the gold standard, we had fixed exchange rates. But an exchange rate is a price between two different things. The pound and the dollar in the 19th century were not two different things. They were different weights of the same thing. So it's wrong to say that that's an exchange rate. That's determined not by the laws of economics, but by the laws of arithmetic. Okay? In the same way that the exchange rate between a quarter and nickels is five to one. Because a quarter is defined as one fourth or 0.25 or 25 cents of a dollar, and a nickel is defined as one twentieth or, or five cents of a dollar. Okay? So, since the quarter refers to five times more of a dollar than, than does a nickel, five nickels exchange for a dollar. Well, uh, for a quarter. Well, the same is true here. Okay. The pound has approximately, had approximately five times the amount of gold that, that in it, okay, that, that it was defined as, and therefore was five times more valuable than the dollar. That's not true today. All national currencies are different things now because they're issued by different monopolists, different monopoly central banks. What was the money supply under the, um, this, what we call a commodity standard? Money developed as a commodity, as a useful commodity. So we called it commodity money. Today we call money fiat money because it's a piece of paper or it could even be this bottle. The, the government or, or, or the US central bank as a legal monopolist that can print money can put in the space here $10 or, or $20, and it would be legal tender. It can use this eraser, it can use my shirt, it can use anything. It's not necessary to use paper. But under a commodity standard, there was one thing that was the, the commodity, that was the money, and that was the physical commodity itself. Okay? So the money supply was the total quantity of, 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 the, of, of the commodity that was in monetary form. The total amount of gold in the country that was in the form of bars, which is called bullion, and coins. Or even gold dust was used in western towns. Or gold nuggets. So all of those things constituted the money supply. So let me just talk a few minutes before I end about how, how did the money supply behave under commodity money? Did we have inflation? Did we have deflation? Um, well, we, in the case of gold, the only time the money supply increased um, was when new gold mines, were just, well, when gold was mined, okay? So it increased very slowly over time. Every once in a while, it would jump because new sources of gold was discovered in Australia um, in the 1870s, um, uh, in California 1849, in South Africa in 1896, and so on. Or when a new improved technology for extracting gold was developed, okay? So, um, there was very little inflation. In fact, there wasn't defl inflation. There was a fall of prices. Since gold increased very slowly and the money supply increased very slowly, the increase in goods and services, okay, real wealth, was, was faster. Um, and so, as a result, what happened was, as the supplies of goods and services shifted out, there was an increase in the supply of these things in relation to money, and money's what lies behind the demand for these things, prices actually fell. So to take an example, um, even though the money supply is being increased very rapidly um, and has been increased very rapidly um, since World War II, we still found that if goods and services in certain sectors of our economy increase more rapidly than, than, than the money supply, prices are going to fall and we're all going to benefit from those falling prices. So we'll take the example of computers. A mainframe computer produced by IBM in, in, in the 70s cost about $3 million. Um, and a personal computer today costs $500. The personal computer is faster and has more memory. Okay. So we've had tremendous drop in prices. Now, did this deflation cause any sort of problems in the computer industry? 
fact, no. In 1980, there was about a half a million com uh, per personal computers shipped. By 1999, 20 years later, despite the fact that prices had come down from 20,000 to less than 1,000 for personal computers, you had 11 million, or 22 times the amount of computers shipped. So falling prices, when they occur naturally on the market as a result of goods and services being um, increased due to changes in technology, improvements in technology, and, and in capital that raises labor productivity, brings about a very benign or benevolent, benign, um, uh, what we call growth deflation. Okay? So that's actually what happened in the 19th century. So just to, to, to end up with just a few of the um, statistics, very simple. Um, in 1800, um, a dollar that was uh, one dollar in 1800, um, it only took about 79 cents to purchase what a dollar in 1800 could buy. By 1913, 113 years later, the value of money had gone up about 27 percent. In other words, what you could buy in 1800 for a dollar only cost you 79 cents to buy in 1913. What you could buy in 1913, this is after the Fed came into existence, for a dollar, doesn't cost you less, it costs you much more. It costs you $22 today. So under the commodity standard, the value of the gold dollar went up by about 27% because prices fell very gently. Under the, the fiat standard that's controlled by a central bank, the uh, Federal Reserve System, the value of the dollar has shrunk to about a nickel of what it was worth in 1913 when the Fed was established. Okay. So um, basically what you got for all countries on the gold standard during the 19th century was a, ver was a very slow decline in prices, which meant that all the fruits of, of improved technology, of increased uh, investments in machines and other uh, labor uh, productivity increasing type um, investments, all of those things were spread to the whole population. Whether your salary was going up or not in money terms, because prices were going down, as they have with computers, your dollar became more powerful. So if, you've gone, if you go back to a commodity standard, you'll find that over time, the value of money would rise. So uh, under the gold standard, um, eventually the governments, I didn't get into this, so hopefully that, that will be covered. The gov governments began to get involved. They, they took over monopolies of the mints, um, and then they debased the coins. They made them small, lower and lower in weight. The kings would, would call back the coins to recoin them, and then they would, if it was one full ounce, let's say King Nitwit was you know, the king of some realm, and so he, 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 the first thing he would do is put a name on the coin um, you know, and his face when he took over the, the mint. And he would charge people a lot of money to get their gold mint into coins. And that's called seniorage. Um, so that monopoly price for getting your, your, your um, gold coin, uh, gold coined. So in any case, what would happen then is every once in a while the coins would get worn or a new king would come in and want to put his face on it. So they'd call the coinage back. So instead of giving you a full ounce of gold back, they would only give you eight tenths of an ounce of gold. And they would put the same um, name on it, one nit. So what, what they would do is, in, in, in effect, increase the money supply by 20%, because they would keep that 20% that they stole from, from the people who were turning in the, their gold coins and mint them into their own coins so they could pay for their more palaces, wars, mistresses, and so on. Over time, after, and after the printing press was discovered, they found that an easier way of, of, of creating money um, that was less costly, was simply to print paper, get a, set up a central bank, and the first central bank that was set up in that fashion was the Bank of England in 1694, get the bank to loan them money to pay for the wars and so on, and then the bank would promise to pay back the notes that the king spent in gold. And so f people got used to paper money over time. We still had a gold standard, but to get to your question, by the 19th century, it wasn't a pure commodity standard anymore. So the central banks would keep maybe 20, 30, or 40 percent of the notes that they issued in the form of gold. And then you had private banks beginning to start, and they would hold not gold itself, or they'd hold very little gold, but they'd hold the notes of the central bank. So eventually, all of the gold, which backed up the money, became centralized in the central bank. So maybe you had 10% backing up, let's say there was um, you know, $10 million in the economy, there was only $1 million worth of gold in the central bank. So that if everyone came and, and demanded gold, or even a significant proportion of the population, because they didn't trust the paper money, 
the whole system would collapse literally like a, a house of cards. Okay. So there were problems under even the gold standard um, because the banks could produce, create paper money and lend it out, pushing the interest rate down and causing inflation to occur. And at that point, when prices went up, people began to buy goods from other countries where the prices were lower. But other countries didn't want the paper, they wanted gold. So at least under the gold standard, the central banks would start to lose gold as people turn in their dollars to pay for their imports from China and so on. At that point, everyone would begin to get fearful that they wouldn't get their gold back. So the central banks had to stop inflating. So the gold standard was called the golden handcuffs. Because if the banks got too inflationary, gold would start to flow out. People would see that. The clients of the banks who deposited their money would see that. And they would begin to get nervous. And then that would increase the outflow of gold because people would rush to the banks. So to prevent that from happening, they always nipped the inflation in the bud. So after 1933, we went off the gold standard. Almost all, every country did. Um, they tried to reconstruct it after World War II in 1946. It was called the Bretton Woods system. It was a brainchild of, of John Maynard Keynes and of um, uh, H uh, Henry Dexter White, or Harry Dexter White, who turned out to be a Soviet spy. Um, he, he worked for the, tre the US Treasury. And that system was a phony gold standard. Normal people like you or, or I or our grandparents and parents could not redeem their dollars for gold at, at the stated price of $35 per ounce. Only the only the, the, the foreign central banks and governments could do that. But the U.S. continued to inflate to pay, for the, to pay for the Vietnam War and then also for the war on poverty under President Johnson. And as a result of that, we began to lose a lot of gold to the rest of the world. Initially, people were willing to hold U.S. dollars because we had most of the gold at the end of World War II. And since our own people couldn't get hold of that gold, they couldn't convert their dollars, um, the rest of the world said, you know what, there's more than enough gold to to accommodate all the outstanding dollars. But we, we caused uh, the, the, the Fed to pay for government deficits, created so much money during the 60s that by the end, towards the end of the 60s, I think there was something like $12 billion worth of gold that we had, and foreign, foreigners held $80 billion. So that's when the French, uh, under de Gaulle, and the Germans wanted to um, convert their, their dollars en masse into gold. And, and we, we, uh, we basically um, uh, blackmailed the Germans and, and tried to blackmail the French by saying, you know, we have to remove our nuclear umbrella. We have to stop protecting you against the Soviet Union. If you, if you do this, it's going to cost us a lot of money. In any case, the Germans backed off. The French dropped out of NATO. And um, at the end of the whole story, um, we still were losing gold like crazy. So by 1971, we had about two, month, two weeks left of gold. And so President Nixon then, this, it's 40 years this past August, right? Yeah, stepped to the podium and said, He's closing the gold window. So we reneged on a solemn pledge to the rest of the world that we made in 1946. And the whole thing collapsed. From 71 on, there was enormous inflation because now there was no more danger at all of losing any gold. Yeah? Would you recommend going back to a, a, gold, a gold standard or some kind of commodity-based standard? And if so, how, how would you accomplish that? Uh, the, the answer to the first question is yes. And the answer to the second question is that it's very, very difficult. But I think you could accomplish the first few steps in that direction. Um, a few of the things that you could do is, is to allow people to buy and sell gold without any capital gains taxes, without any sales taxes, excise taxes, remove all the taxes on gold and silver so that now people could use them if they wanted as a parallel currency. At the same time, allow people to, to, to hold euro deposits in American banks and, and Swiss franc deposits. So then the American government would have to be looking at the fact that their the, the deposits of uh, dollar deposits are, are losing popularity vis-a-vis um, -vis these other alternative monies. So that's one way that you, you could begin to go back in that direction. And, and in the meantime, stop the inflation. But what about repealing legal, legal tender laws? Yeah, I bet you're absolutely right. And repeal legal tender laws. So people could make their contracts in gold, silver, and they would have to pay them in, 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 in gold and silver. Because legal tender allows you to pay your, any debt you owe in, in paper money. Okay, it forces the creditor to accept the paper money. Uh, yes? Uh, just extending off what he just said, yeah. uh, it actually seems to be that the most common objection to going back to the gold standard is that there's just not enough in the world today. Right. So is that actually true? Well, remember that um, 
There's not enough of anything in the world to satisfy all the human wants for it. That's why we have prices for things. So if the price is right, what we, in, 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 under the Soviet Union at the end, um, even a simple item like um, toilet paper was in short supply. If you saw the movie Moscow on the Hudson, people were lining up to get toilet paper because the prices were kept so low. Well, the same thing is true with gold. At, at, at some price of gold, there'll be enough to, to, to back you know, the dollars and so on. Um, and also, I think silver would be used in smaller transactions. Yes. So you're so you're saying um, basically, uh, commodity money uh, often goes up in value, becomes more valuable. That's deflation, and fiat money becomes less valuable yeah. through inflation. Yes. How come a lot of talking heads blame uh, the Japanese recession of what the 80s and 90s on deflation? Because they're confusing depression with deflation. If if you look at it, there, there, there is there is little there is a little deflation. Uh, in, in the Japanese economy. But the money supply was almost always increasing. Okay? So you really can't have a, a deflation without, without a fall in the money supply unless there's a big increase in the demand for money. That people are frightened of the future and want to hold it, which, which happened here in the US in 2008 during the financial crisis. So even though the money supply was going up, the demand to hold the money and not spend it was going up by more. So, so that can cause prices to fall. But that only happens during crisis situations. And so for the most part, Japan did what all the American economists were urging them to do. They ran big deficits, and they increased the money supply. Um, but they are a very productive economy. So they never really had much of a, re of a recession. They had what's called a growth recession. The rate of growth went down. Their economy shrunk only for a few quarters. Okay, so, there, so I would say that the main problem with Japan is the fact that its, its labor markets are extremely rigid. Um, its, its business organizations are, are tied into government and aren't flexible. Uh, and th there was actually a very good article about all of this um, very recently. And um, I can't remember what, what newspaper it last. In fact, I gave it to my class a few days ago. And it had to do with the fact that um, Japanese companies are look, looking down on this new, um, this new startup firm, this new firm, called, I think it's called Uniglow, which um, is selling a lot of clothing throughout the world, like a low-tech product. And that's sort of looked down on in, in, in Japan. And people are dismissing it. But uh, the guy who owns it, Yane, or Yane, is the second wealthiest man in, in Japan now. And he's broken all the, the, the whole Japanese model. He's hired foreigners. And um, he's, um, po oh, he's poaching. He's going to other com companies trying to bid away good talent, which is, isn't done. Okay? So I think it's the rigidity in the Japanese economy that, that um, has a lot of government intervention. That, that really caused that recession. Okay. China had, had falling prices for a long time, and they were growing like crazy. So what, but, but they, you know, because they were very, very entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Yes? Are we, is there a lot of um, money that's only been printed that they're holding to still release into the economy? And what would happen if we do start to repatriate money, um, lower capital gains, decrease regulations, right. and start encouraging the money that's being held also flow into right. the economy. What happens when it comes from both directions? What happens okay, you're asking a good question. The, the first part of that question is that, look, the Fed has increased what's called the monetary base, that is the reserves of the bank and, and currency. And the banks, because of the, of the bad business climate, aren't, le aren't lending them out to the extent that they could lend those reserves out. Okay, they're holding what's called excess reserves. They're allowed to lend out 90% of, of all their deposits, but they're not doing that. Okay? So you're right. If things pick up and that money is lent out, and also, by the way, they're discouraged from lending it out by the fact that the Fed is paying them a quarter of a percent on holding that money at the Fed rather than lending it. Okay? So that could cause an enormous inflation. But what, what the Fed could do to offset that is try to, to um, begin to sell off some of its assets that it has purchased in the mortgage-backed securities and so on, and begin to absorb those extra dollars from the banking system. Because when it sells things to the banking system, the banks have to pay with, the, with their own reserves. So, so, so that's a question you know, of what the Fed will do. And I think they'll try to prevent that sort of inflation. The other part of your question is people, people themselves holding money, investors, and not investing because they're fearful of the costs of, of uh, potential costs of Obamacare, care, what's going to happen to taxes as a result of the trillion dollar deficits we keep racking up, and all of those questions. Um, that kind of spending 
is, is good for the economy. In other words, then people will begin to t take uh, risks to invest in, um, in actually producing goods and services. And that will actually cause prices to fall, all other things equal. Other yes? Milton Friedman blamed uh, the lack of action by the Federal Reserve as one of the causes of the Great Depression. Yes. Uh, if, we went back, if we took away the Fed's ability to expand the money supply, how would we have gotten out of the Great Depression? If we had taken it away before that, we would have never had a, a Great Depression. So, so no, I don't mean to be flipped, but the point is that during the 1920s, the Fed expanded the money supply at between 6 and 7% per year. And it didn't show, see, most American, econ all American economists believe that the, the true indicator of inflation was consumer prices, okay? Whereas the Austrian economists um, who, who, who observed America and who came to America, such as uh, Hayek, the Nobel Prize winner, and Mises from, from, in Austria, they pointed out that the American economy was ex growing tremendously during the 1920s, okay? We had um, electricity now coming into general use, Refriger refrigeration was being developed, cars were being mass produced after World War I, so there was tremendous um, industrial activity. Prices should have actually fallen a great deal every year, but prices didn't change. Between 21 and 28, prices stayed about the same, when they should have come down tremendously. What caused them to, st to stay up? The inflation. The Fed was, was, was inflating the money supply. The money was being lent out by the banks, pushing interest rates down, causing people to speculate in the stock market, drive up real estate prices. So my response to Freeman would be that had they not had that power, prices would have naturally fallen, as they did during the 1880s and 1890s, and we wouldn't have had um, a, a crash that led to the, to the Depression. And, and for the reason why it was extended, and this will be talked about in another lecture, um, is because the um, there, there was a, a lot of legislation that prevented prices and wages from falling to meet this, the fact that people, look, people didn't want to spend during the Depression. They were afraid of the future. So yes, there was a, a downward, there was a, a deflationary pressure. But the Fed, if the Fed tried to, to stop that, they would simply reproduce the problem. So that would be my response. I mean, whether or not, I mean, it's a very short time period to give you that, but there's a lot more to be said. Yes? It seems like surely there are some times when monetary policy would be necessary. Um, maybe where, you know, we did things right, for example, and right. then we still get into a, a new depression, recession, or something like that. What do, you, what do you propose we do then if we don't have access to all of those tools? See, again, that's a good question, and, and I'm not sure how much that confuses depression with deflation, okay? Um, if a depression occurs, it means that the relationship between prices are wrong. That is, costs are too high in relation to selling prices. So businesses don't want to invest. So by holding up wages and holding up a price of agricultural commodities and so on during, during the, the uh, uh, Great Depression, the New Deal prevented the reestablishment of profitable margins. So I, I, let's put it this way. Anything that monetary policy can do, and you're right, maybe in the short run, if you injected money to the economy, you could push prices up so that businessmen believed that there was profit to be made. But a better way of doing it, that's only a short run solution, because then, then the costs catch up again. The better um, approach, the better solution to that is, is, is the, the microeconomic solution. Take, getting rid of all government legislation, such as special privileges to labor unions, minimum wage laws, price supports for foreign products that keep costs up. You said that computers were so much cheaper right now. So are you saying that they should be even cheaper than that? No, yeah, I would love them to go down to a nickel. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, but theoretically, yeah. if we were still under the gold standard, yeah, I mean, prices. Yeah, sure. I mean, the price of a car. It's a very good question. The price of a car was three hundred and fifty dollars in. Um, see, yeah, in 19, 1915 or nineteen sixteen, right? If they sort of be mass produced, um, uh, and maybe they should be that much or a little bit less or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, prices would be going down. Sure. It, it, in other words, the, the actual absolute price doesn't matter. It's always the relationships between prices. If your salary doubled tomorrow, but prices tripled, you would be, you'd be worse off, not better off, right? But if your salary fell by 10% and prices fell by 15%, you'd be better off. So people have to get away from this illusion of just looking at what's happening to the height, the actual height of these nominal prices. It's always the relationships between prices. Yeah, yeah. I think you're talk, trying to talk about it, but I'm missing what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, at what point do the falling prices become an issue for the producer? I mean, we see that with agriculture today. Right. You know, sometimes like potatoes and those are part, they produce so much of it that they almost become, you can't make a living on yeah. producing it anymore. Okay, there's two parts. 
uh, two answers to that, to that question. That's a good question. Um, the first part is that in, 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 in industries that are growing, like computers, their costs are coming down faster than the prices are dropping. That's why the computer industry is expanding even though prices are dropping. Okay, so there are industries like that you don't have to worry about. As long as costs are falling, no matter how far prices fall, as long as costs are falling too, and, and they're producing more because it's now more profitable, you're going to have growth. The problem comes, comes let's say, with farmers. There are too many farmers. In other words, we, we are supporting inefficient um, of farming because what happens is that as f there's farming technology develops, some of the smaller farms are unable to take advantage of that and would go out of business normally as prices come down. Okay? We don't let that happen with all our, our, our farm subsidies and so on. So that's a market adjustment that needs to happen. We used to have 200 years ago maybe 97% of the labor force worked on farming and, and, we, bar and we could barely feed the whole United States. Um, do you know how many people are, or what proportion is involved in farming today? One and a half percent. So we've, all those jobs went elsewhere. And that's fine because farming labor is so much more productive today because of capital investment, technological improvement, and so on. But that doesn't mean that in some cases you're going to have bit firms going out of business as a result of these low prices. Okay. But if those prices aren't manipulated in any way, then that's, that's giving a signal that, look, we have too, too, much, too many farming goods and not enough of other goods. So if we didn't have these farming subsidies, yeah. um, there would be no need for a price war because naturally the farm, there would be less farmers producing less right. prices. Right. In other words, the prices would, you're right, as, 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 the more efficient farms would expand as these other farms went out of business. In terms of if the prices for computers could drop to, say, I don't know, maybe $200 a computer. Right. But right now, they're able to and making a decent amount of money charging, say, sure. $1,000 why wouldn't they simply charge still $1,000 a computer because they could get enough people to buy them? Uh, Competition. Because the other guy's going to... A ballpoint pen, when it first was introduced in 1946, sold for $25. Now, in today's world, that's $200 or something, like eight times as much. Um, you know, people would leave them out on their coffee tables just as, you know, as you would leave a BMW in your, just to show that you were affluent. Within two years, that price came, was, went from you know, $25 to, to, to 18 cents or something like that. And the cost had come down to like 10 cents because of the fierce competition. You can prevent that from happening if you pat allow patents and, and crap and stuff like that. But, um, but otherwise, you're just going to have, and that's what you had with, the, with, with, um, with, with computers. But why wouldn't that competition I mean, occur now as well? Why wouldn't someone it is occurring. That, that much? Why would, but why aren't prices lower than that? Because they're as low as costs will permit them to be. Look, if anyone can enter, if anyone can enter, and no one is entering, it means that there's some sort of equilibrium, right? That that return, rate of return, is 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 what everyone is satisfied with. Okay. But now, if somebody finds a, an even cheaper way of making it, so that they can increase the return to themselves, they'll enter and they'll sell at a slightly lower price, and and then the others will have to adopt that new technology or go out of business. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. Um, this is the first again in our three-part series. Um, the next one will be occurring in October. The third one will be in November. Um, October's uh, lecture will be on what is constitutional money. We will be looking at what, how the Constitution looks at a dollar and um, what those ramifications are for the economy. And then in November, we will be discussing what is it about money that causes economic crises? How did we get into this financial mess that we're in now? So uh, I hope you will join us for that. Details will be coming shortly. Um, and thank you again for coming. And please, let's give another round of applause for Dr. Sawyer. Thank you. Thank you.